I will talk to you about the ark. Everybody knows about the ark. If you've ever watched Indiana Jones, you know about the ark, okay? <laughs> All right? Now, let me talk to you about the Ark of the Covenant. There was four arks in the Bible. There was Noah's Ark, Genesis 6, 14. There was the Ark that Moses was buried in, Genesis 2, 3. There's the Ark of the Covenant, Exodus 25 and 10. And there's the Ark that the Torah scrolls were put in. You may not know this, but in a synagogue uh, where the speaker stands, right directly behind the speaker, that's what's called an Ark. A lot of times it'll be a box. In the older synagogues, it could be carved in and put in, and the Torah scrolls are placed in there, and that's called an Ark. All right, but this ark is called the Ark of the Covenant. Why is it the Ark of the Covenant? Because the tablets of the law that God made, the covenant he made with Israel, was placed inside this box. And that's why it's called Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant is a picture of God's throne. This had to be carried by four priests, two on one end, two on the other, just like the throne of God in Ezekiel chapter 1 is carried by four cherubim. Two cherubim in the front, two cherubim in the back. Read your Bible. And the throne of God can actually become wheels like a chair and they carry, it's called the Merkabah in Hebrew, and they carry the throne of God. Very interesting if you've never studied that. All right, in, in, uh, in the dimensions of the ark, it's two and a half cubits long, one and a half cubits uh, wide. Uh, basically, measurements, it's three and three quarters foot long, two and a uh, four feet, feet wide, 40 or 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, but 27 inches high. There's that number 27 again. Let me talk to you about the menorah. How the number 27 came up, there's that number 27 again. All right. Now, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to show you something that to me is pretty, 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 uh, pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. All right. When I went to this institute years ago, when I went to this institute, the lady showed me something about the ark that I did not know, and I never heard this taught before, okay? <clears throat> the mercy seat... I'm going to lift this. Thank God I'm not going to die because this is styrofoam. <laughs> There's your mercy seat. All right. Now, if you were to take this lid off, which the men of Beshemesh did, you would die. And I'll explain why. Because inside of the ark was the law. And the only thing that the law brought death. Remember what Paul said? The law, the law produced death, right? In other words, that's why it was given, to, talk, to, to, to tell you the difference between life and death. You broke the law, you died. So that's what he's talking about. Now, you put the law in the ark, and you put the mercy seat between you and the law, you'll live. Because there's blood on the mercy seat. If you lift the mercy away from the ark, all you have is the law. And the law could bring judgment to you if you disobeyed it. When the men of Beshemesh moved the ark, they looked in it. Remember, 50,000 dropped dead because they, they took away the blood and the mercy. When you take away blood and mercy, you have judgment. That's my point. Okay. At the institute, the woman showed me this, and I thought this was absolutely incredible, that the ark was not just wood covered with gold. She said their story handed down for generations is that inside of this box was a, a wooden box, just like this, but wood, touching this gold, and then a very thin gold box. And she pulled out of a model a gold, it looked like the ark, gold thin box, wooden box, and then this, this box. Three in one. Well... I can't get no help up in this place tonight. Three and one. See, gold is deity, wood is humanity, and then you've got wood covered with gold. Christ was with God, deity, became wood humanity, and as man and God, wood and gold is our high priest in heaven. The man Jesus Christ ever living to make intercession for us. Okay, now, let me show you what happened. When she said this, okay, when she said this about these three compartments, there's a man with me named Tom Evison who is an engineer. I've never forgot this. And Tom said, oh no, oh my goodness, a capacitor for electricity. And I said, what do you mean? He said, and he explained to me about the wood and the gold tray on the inside. He said, Perry, I'm telling you, this is what would happen in this box. The electric electricity in the air called static electricity would build up 
on this ark that if you touched it with one hand, it would shock you so bad it would knock you down. But if you touched it with both hands, it could kill you. And he kept saying, oh my Lord, oh my goodness, it's a capacitor for electricity. Now the woman heard him and said, you know, you remember the man, she named quoted the Bible, that touched the ark with both hands and he died. Now I believe God just struck him. I, don't have, I personally don't believe it had a lot to do with electricity. I think God just struck him. But he was saying to me, I said, okay, now Tom, if you're telling me that that box is that dangerous, how'd they carry it? He said, right here, the staffs, it grounds out everything. He said, as long as you keep the staves inside the ark, and God said about the ark, the staves in the ark shall never be removed. All right, now, I'm not, I'm not going to try to get weird on you here, but I know a story in Jerusalem. First of all, first of all, Josephus says that um, one of the leaders back in his day wanted to find the tomb of David and Solomon. And when they went and broke in, there's a church, there's an old church built there now, underground, there was fire and electricity or something that came out and killed all the men. And it was so dangerous that they sealed it up and put a monument there. There was a group of men in, uh, years ago, this is a long time back, who were on search for holy relics in the Holy Land and broke through that same area and had the same electrical charge that almost killed them. Someone said to me, if the ark exists in its old state, there is so much electrical power in the natural built up on it, you can't get near it without dying. Now, that, that's speculation that's yet to be seen. But I do know this. If you messed with that ark, if you messed with it, Exodus 25, 14, the staves shall be in the rings and shall not be taken from them. Why? Maybe God had a natural reason, but the, the point is you could not mess with it. Now, measurements on the ark, follow me carefully. The circumference of the end is one and a fourth, one and a fourth, four times. One, two, three, four, okay? That's six. The circumference of the top is two and a half long, two and a half long by one and a half, one and a half. That's eight. Totals the number eight. Woo! Now, six is the number of man. Eight is the number of resurrection. If you combine the ends of the one halves, half, half, one and a 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 half, that totals eight times one and a half to 12, which is government perfection. If you take the, let me just say it this way. You got the number six, you got the number eight, you got the number 10, you got the number 12. Six is the number of man. It gives man the ability to approach God. Eight is the number of resurrection because Jesus brought new life through his death, gave us resurrection. 10 is the 10 commandments. It means law and order. And 12 is perfect government. And everything connected to the Ark of the Covenant it's connected to the plan of God. The mercy seat. Let me talk about that mercy seat on top that you just saw. You will make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall you make it. It shall be the length thereof and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of beaten work that you shall make them in the ends of the mercy seat. 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, gold seat with cherubim on top of it. Now the mercy seat in Hebrew is called kippereth and it comes from the word kephar, which, which is to pitch, to pitch. Like in Noah's ark in Genesis chapter 6, 14, it says they pitched the ark within and without with pitch. One word pitch means a tarry substance. The second word pitch used in Genesis chapter 6, 14 is the word for atone. They atone the ark by using pitch to protect it or cover it. In the New Testament, it uses the word propitiation. Christ is the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation literally means our mercy seat. He, <laughs> that, no, don't pat a cake on that. That's a good place to praise God right there. On the mercy seat were two cherubs that faced each other, Exodus 25 and verse 20. The cherubs' wings were lifted up, covering the seat, Exodus 25, 20. Their faces looked down at the mercy seat because they didn't look up at God when God came down to talk. Number Exodus chapter 25 and 22, God said, Now Moses, I will come down between the wings of the cherub and commune to you above the mercy seat. 
The word commune is interesting. In Hebrew, it's the word dabar, which means to speak or to hear the voice of God. Here's a scripture. And when Moses was gone to the tabernacle of the congregation to speak to, the, to him, then he heard the voice of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat that was upon the ark of the testament from between the two cherubs, and he spoke unto him. So this is where God would come down. Now, there's also a little difference of opinion as to uh, the wing, the, now this is, this is a design, again, that, that one of the Temple Institute people came up with. But others have a cherubim as a creature with four legs like an ox. Uh, it has legs like a calf. This is in your Bible. has the head of a lion. And you see some of these in Egyptian drawings that may actually be cherubim that somebody drew. And you see these in early Egypt, okay? And some have these two animals, almost like animal-looking creatures facing each other. But most have an, uh, angelic forms. Normally, they do not ever put a face on anything. The cherubims, more than likely, when it said their faces were down, they wouldn't have put eyes, ears, nose, and mouth. Can anybody tell me why? It's very simple. Idolatry. The fear of them worshiping a creature or worshiping an animal was forbidden by God. So therefore, nothing uh, ever had a face actually put. It may have the form of a face, but normally not have a face. But there are others that say, one rabbi wrote, and he says, it is my opinion that one wing of the angel touched this way and the other wing of the angel touched that way and actually formed a seat. And the Lord actually reduced his presence into that room and how he reduced God's presence, but came into that form and sat down on that seat and communed. But there was a voice that could be heard over the mercy seat. And the one thing, the first time you'll ever really hear his voice is when he extends mercy to you. First time you ever heard him was when you were a sinner and he said, come unto me, I'll give you rest. Come unto me, I want to save you. I can help you if you let me. First time you, you say, I never heard God's voice. I guarantee you if you got saved, you did. <laughs> now, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant was a holy before God. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring something out right here. I'm going to bring something out. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done with this session, but I've got to get into this. There's no way I could get away with not getting into this. All right. Oh, hallelujah. Now, in the Ark of the Covenant. Paul talks about this in the book of Hebrews. He says there was three things that were in that Ark. Anybody know what it was? All right, I'm going to show you. He Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4. There was nothing in the Ark except Aaron's rod that blossomed, a golden pot of manna, and the tablets of the law. Let's start out with the manna. I'm going to show you the real deal right here. Ready? I have in my hand what's called a coriander seed. If you've never seen a coriander seed, it's very small. And, it's, and these are painted white. They're not normally white, but these are painted white. A coriander seed has little bitty stripes in it. The manna that fell in the wilderness, the Bible says, looked like a coriander seed. Okay? And it was white in color, the manna was. And it says that it had a, a kind of an oily and a honey taste to it. Then you could take the manna and you could beat it and you could bake it, you could cook it, you could do different things with it. Now, Machamonides, who was a rabbi, I think in the 12th century, if I'm not mistaken, right around there, he made a commentary that in his opinion, God, when they ate the manna, it tasted like the food they wanted it to taste like. Now, that would be pretty cool because you eat this stuff for 40 years. It's going to get old after a while. In fact, they did complain, if you'll remember. All we got is manna, then they wanted quail to eat, remember? But uh, to me, you know, the, the neatest thing about heaven would be if you could eat the manna of heaven, which the Bible said we're going to have hidden manna in heaven, and just say, steak. <laughs> you know what I'm going to do, baby? Banana split. That's right. <laughs> Big banana split. Milkshake, all that stuff I can't eat now. That's right, that's right. You look at me, I'm doing it. That's right. Okay? But, but, watch this. He had the golden pot of manna, all right? That was in the ark. Now, 
Then we're told that the tablets of the law, now they were written actually on both sides. We just did it on one. Now this, this, this is an example right here. That's old writing. Probably got that upside down. <laughs> I do. <laughs> How can I tell? I can't even read this. All right? But anyway, tablets of the law. That's upside down, too. <laughs> tablets of the law. This was the law that, now remember, you all, do, you, you all do know that God wrote with the finger of his hand on this. Are you aware of the tradition that it was sapphire that he wrote them on? That the surface of the earth's crust, according to Wayne Penn, who's a laser scientist on my board, that there's aluminum oxide that, that in the Earth's crust. He's a laser scientist who made synthetic sapphire for the space shuttle, okay? And it take, you have to heat aluminum oxide with some other things to a certain temperature. It crystallizes. You can, form, you can form sapphire. He said when God wrote on the rock with the finger of his hand, theoretically, it became a sapphire. Now, it's thrown to sapphire. Now, let me tell you, let me tell you some Bible for it. Go to the book of Exodus where it says, underneath the feet of God where he was walking was a paved sapphire stone. So tradition says, and it's very possible that when Moses came down, he didn't just come down with two pieces of rock. When God wrote on that, he had two pieces of sapphire that was carved with the commandments of God because they, they said that according to what was handed down by history, you could see through, you could see the letters by looking through it. So that wouldn't be a normal stone. Is everybody still here? <laughs> Say, I'm still here. <laughs> now, watch carefully because I'm almost, I'm almost at my point. So we got that. Then the third thing that was put in there was Aaron's rod. Now, I don't know. Aaron, you know, to me, I always thought of a rod being about six foot tall. They may have cut the bottom of this, I don't know, to make it fit the ark because that ark is only uh, three and three quarters feet long. But what happened was, and we'll talk about this at some point, when they wanted to know who the priest was, they laid the rod down and Aaron's rod produced almonds. Hey, hello, the menorah. What's, about, what, what's the menorah ornaments? The three you know, the cop and the flower and the, and not the three, the three uh, growth processes of an almond tree. So the almond blossom, you can imagine getting up in the morning and you got a dead tree limb that's got fruit. Someone said, well, how do you know when you really have the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I'm going to tell you how you really know when you get fruit. You know, I know, I know we full gospel folks. We talk about speaking in tongues. I believe in that hundred percent, but I'm going to tell you something. I know some people speak in tongues. They ain't got the fruit. Preach. I think I could. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Why would these three things be in the ark? Because the ark is a picture of Christ himself. So Christ himself, and these are inside. Everybody say inside. inside. I'm going to tell you why. Because these represent the three blessings God gives every believer that's promised in the new covenant. Your three main blessings. Ready? First of all is the manna. Jesus said, I am the bread come down from heaven, so therefore he is the manna. Manna represents your salvation. The first thing you do when you come to know Christ is you begin to partake of Christ. You eat of the manna. But you see, the Bible said man can't live by bread alone. Now you can make it to heaven by getting the manna. You accept Jesus, you're going to make it to heaven. But if you want to live on this life, you got to go a step further to get into the word of God or the law of God. This represents salvation. This represents sanctification or separation. What did the law do? It separated the people from sin. It separated them from their flesh. It separated them from their self. It gave them a moral structure of which to live by. So in other words, you've got salvation, which is promised in the new covenant, but you can't just stay saved. You've got to bump up a little higher and get free from your habits, delivered from your problems, set free, sanctified. But wait a minute. A lot of churches believe in salvation, sanctification. You've got some great denominations in the United States that preach sanctification very, very heavy. But don't stop at sanctification. Go back in the ark and find out that you've got something called the rod. What does the rod represent? This is the rod that Aaron did the miracles with. Do you understand that when Moses went to Egypt, he did not use his rod for the first three or four miracles? The Bible said he used Aaron's rod, and that's why Aaron was chosen as the priest, because Aaron was willing to stand with Moses in the most difficult time of Israel's history when they were trying to get the people free. This was the miracle rod. This represents the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And once you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, you're going to be able to produce fruit. So inside the Ark of the Covenant were three things. Your salvation is in the Ark. Your sanctification is in the Ark. Your baptism of the Holy Ghost is in the Ark. Because Jesus said, I will pray the Father and he will send you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Oh my. Now wait a minute. In Solomon's time, you'll find out that they took, somebody took the rod out and somebody took the manna out. And in Solomon's time, if you'll read your Bible, the only thing that was in the Ark was the law. What does it mean? It means they took the salvation out of the teaching of Jesus and they took the power of the Holy Spirit.
the Holy Ghost out of the teaching of Jesus, and all they've got now is just open up your Bible for a 21-minute sermon on Sunday. I'm telling you that in Solomon's day, they had word, but they had no spirit. They had word, and they had taken away the altar calls. They had taken away the call for salvation. We've got churches that don't even give an altar call for the sinners anymore. They've not done it in years, but I'm trying to say to you that if you want the fullness of the blessing of God, and you want the fullness that's in the Ark of the Covenant, you need to be saved, you need to be set free, and you need to be baptized in the power of the Holy Ghost. Perry Stone is pleased to announce the release of his Secrets of the Holy Place Tabernacle series with nine new DVDs, approximately 16 hours of remarkable Hebraic insights and wisdom regarding the Wilderness Tabernacle and the Secrets of the Holy Place. Using a life-size replica of Moses' tabernacle, including intricate replicas of the sacred furniture, Perry combines 40 years of research on these nine compelling and powerful DVDs, giving you perhaps the most detailed revelation and exciting discoveries of patterns and mysteries you will ever hear, explaining the redemption code concealed in the tabernacle boards, curtains, pins, priesthood, and holy furniture. Preached before a live audience, the subjects include Living in the Shadow of God, Tabernacle Secrets, Amazing Insights and Messages Concealed in the Tabernacle Furniture, Secrets of the Priesthood and the Priestly Garments, Priestly Rituals for Spiritual War that Believers Must Follow Today, Holy Smoke, David's Tabernacle and the Shadow of God, The Blessings of Corbin and Prophecies in the Menorah, Christ Our Melchizedek and the Mystery of the Blood, the Sinai Code, the Festivals and the Concealed Mysteries of the Cross, the Believer's Royal Priesthood, Prophetic Insights, and much more. You will enjoy approximately 16 hours of uniquely illustrated teaching on DVD, which includes scriptures, important pictures, and other indispensable information edited into the teaching. Perry has never offered anything of this magnitude in the history of his ministry and is limiting the amount of time this special offer is available. This beautifully packaged nine DVD set, Secrets of the Holy Place Tabernacle series, is available for a special donation of just $135 or more, which will assist us in keeping the Manifest Television program on the air. Order now by calling toll-free 1-888-21-BREAD. That's 1-888-212-7323. Or order online at perrystone.org. You may also write us at Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee 37320 and enclose your gift of just $135 or more and request offer 9DV001. We look forward to hearing from you soon.